Welcome to PMA Corporation, home of the MC Emacs. I'd like to thank you for joining us as we continue along in our presentation series. My name is Todd Gunderson, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing, and once again we have Noah Bethel, the Vice President of Product Development with us. Hello from sunny Tampa, Florida. Well, no, it's it's been a while, but we've got a, a great case study on a boiler feed pump. And you, from your nuclear days, and myself, made essentially they were power plants on board ships, weren't they? That's right, floating power plants. And those boiler feed pumps were very critical to us. Critical assets, and they had to be running, no question. So this is no different, even though it may not be, uh, this is land-based for a power plant, but this is a situation that we find ourselves in, and, and we wanted to kind of step back. We're always showing you data, but this is the first thing you see in our MC Gold software. What what do you usually go after? What's your first point? Right, depending on someone's you know experience with the technology, some use very few of these, and others use many of them. But I always say, if you're a, kind of a new user's, go right at the fault zone analysis, which is the bullseye target there, which kind of gives you a, a PDMA software assessment of the of the asset you're interested in. So when we click that, it's going to send us directly to this screen here. It's called our ocular fault zone. Right, and if you see anything, we usually say red is bad, and there's a lot of red on this fault zone. And you can see we've split this up into our six fault zones. So we have all six covered here. Now, I see 32.78 pole pass sideband amplitude. What determines that number? What puts that in red? Good question. So PDMA has collected over the many years of motor testing, uh, industry standards from everyone from IEEE, ESA, NEMA, you name it, EPRI studies. We've, we've built all those standards into our you know caution and alarm set points, including PDMA standards that we ourselves have developed over the many years of analysis. So that's, even though we're showing the rotor, which is in red, and the outer ring shows the actual set point for it, but you could do the same for stator, insulation, power quality, power circuit, air gap. They're all, they Absolutely. all have numbers. And so with, like, for instance, stator in green, if you sl if you click on the stator with green, it's going to give you a normal uh, text as far as that, that value. Anything in caution would give you the caution text. So it's a really quick way of getting the PDMA you know, auto analysis software to give you an assessment of the asset you're interested in. You had also said that we use standards. What if uh, a plant is very restrictive and they want to pull things much quicker? They're very critical assets. Can we change those set points? Absolutely. One of the things we've learned over the years is that local intelligence outweighs many times regional or, or, or national intelligence. You know, so even though, you know, we have general standards based on NEMA or non-NEMA based motors, a lot of times when you have history on site, you're going to be far better at assessing where the severe level should be. All right, so let's get into the data. Now, this is the actual information, the data portion of it, once we've clicked on that rotor uh, raw data for this motor. What is this telling us? So this is a current signature spectrum, and, and what's interesting is the, you know, we talk about red being bad. We, we try to help out the end user or the analyst to say, hey, this is where the industry standards from a red line indicates that it's gotten too high. What is it? Well, it's the pole pass amplitude with the red X on it. And that's basically a relationship between the rotor and stator indicating that that magnetic field is creating this peak and it is in a severe condition. And if you notice, if it wasn't above the red, let's say it was just above the yellow, then instead of that ocular being all red, it would have been yellow, correct? Correct. With the recommended guidelines to, to do more testing, to contact the tech support at PDMA and get an assessment from them. Yeah, just typical increased frequency. Absolutely. And this is just the offline standard test. They, I don't, they did not do a rotor influence check on this, but what is this telling us here? What can we look at on this track? Uh, this graph, excuse me, or these these uh, standard tests. Right. So from a history chart perspective, we always say trend is your friend, right? And so it's nice to see a trend information. In this situation, you can see time date stamps. Now, this is over, you know, basically a one-year period. We've seen history from 10-year periods. So the more history you get, the more or the better decision you could probably make. One of the things that uh, that stands out to me is the, the alarming levels. And it won't take long for an analyst to look at that and say, hey, this data obviously was from a different motor, a different test location. Uh, they should really clear that out to make sure it's not creating a false alarm. I notice up here you have test location. That's really important too, is it? It's very important because right now looking at this, not a sign doesn't tell me where that odd test location was. If we knew that was tested like, you know, at the switch gear with just the cables because they wanted to test the cables only, then we would understand that data, but we don't have that idea. From the standard test to analyze rotors, the one component on this graph or on these test data points is average inductance, correct? Yeah, you hear us talk about average inductance as a trend, one of the six methods of rotor defect assessment. 
In fact, as we look at that, it starts out about 12.3 millihenries of average inductance and ends at 12.5. Not a huge difference, but it's, it's another thing that sort of you can correlate to say, listen, it's, it's indicating a change and it, and it correlates with the spectrum. Makes you more confident in making a call. Yeah, or just increasing the frequency of testing. Exactly. So they decided to do an internal inspection, and this is what it revealed. One completely broken bar. Now, this was a four-pole motor, but it was had 84 bars in it. So you can tell it was a pretty large motor, 4,500 kilowatts, mm. uh, or excuse me, horsepower. horsepower. Um, one completely broken bar, four poles. So you, it may not fall, fly out of the slots. We're not as, uh, obviously, we're concerned, but a two-pole would be worse. Less centrifugal, centrifugal force, so that is going to result in a little less concern. Six bars lifted out through the top of the rotor slot. Uh, a lot of rubbing on the stator core. Now that could be bad too, right? If we have too many, too much uh, of the lost core of the stator, what is that? Is that a problem? Absolutely. One of the things that points out is when you're talking about, you know, top of the rotor slot, that tells us it's an open rotor design so that the rotor bar can effectively come out and touch the stator core and, and start doing the damage. Now, as far as a problem, when you start to rub off that stator core, you're, you're going to create a lot of heating, eddy current losses, uh, drop in efficiency, you know, uh, non-symmetrical heating, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to result in a need to restack both the rotor and stator, which mm -hmm. gets really expensive. And now we had 18 visibly broken bars, maybe allowing some current through, but not as efficient as it could be. Cost savings, uh, it requires two boiler feed pumps to run. Uh, there were three in place, so it just it gives you that extra little bit of concern. If you lose one of them, now you're really down to the critical factor. If you lose that second one, now you're having to reduce power. Uh, repair would be about 350000 a little bit shorter time period to get that accomplished, but replacement would have been two fifty. a little cheaper, but boy, it would have taken, I think, a year and a half in, in these mm. COVID times and supply chain crisis and things of that nature. It's really difficult to get things done in a timely manner. We're, we know that here personally. Oh, yeah. And lost megawatts is more expensive than yes. 250000 one week to just remove and dismantle for inspection was $10,000. So mm. we're talking a major motor here. Let's take a look at the rotor and we can see uh, some of this stress, the rubbing you can see. Uh, these blue lines, do, they, do the rotors come with that yeah. when they're shipped? Yeah, we've been asked, is that, is that a manufacturer uh, the marks? No, and uh, it's it, you hate to see the blue mark of death, I guess you could call that. And a uh, lot of, lot of uh, you can see a lot of rubbing, uh, definitely the darkening, as you said, which is like basically the, you know, the leftover steel, you know, remnants of the of the, the, the steel dust that, that creates from the rubbing of the rotor and the stator. Uh, a couple bars definitely coming out of the slot, like we mentioned, an open bar design. You can see the rubbing. This is a, a, a big deal. You wish that they would have had more than a year of history. It had have been great if they had a couple years. We would have seen this coming on and could have maybe reduced some of the damage. You know, you catch this early enough, you might be able to braise the end, in, you know, the end of that uh, rotor bar to the slip to the shorting ring and and keep operating this motor without the kind of damage that they received. Now, one thing here you can see, um, they're all grouped together, and you you mention this quite often when you're in your presentations and your seminars with uh, the the amount of tension uh, due to the heating of the bars that are parallel to the broke one. Can you go through that? Absolutely, right. With the, Like on startup, as an example, when you start a motor of this size up, that bar is going to increase temperature about a, 100 degrees. And a 100 degree increase in temperature is going to create a significant axial stress uh, on all the bars together. That as long as they're all healthy, we're talking as much as nine tons of axial stress. Well, if you start to reduce the heating of a bar that's not carrying its load, it doesn't expand at the same rate, and what's going to happen is you're going to end up breaking that bar. The bars next to it are going to have to work harder, and then they're going to go through the same process. So they tend to break in groups, as you see here, all six or eight or whatever of them are right next to each other. Now, as you can see here, also the stator is the damage from the rotor rubbing against the stator. Right, and it doesn't look severe. And they're gonna probably do some testing here. They're gonna, you know, hook the, when they get this motor apart, they'll do core loss examinations of this of the of the stator iron. And hopefully they can save this. But if not, again, restacking and rewinding that stator becomes expensive. Well, Noah, thanks. Uh, I know it's real rainy. You said sunny Tampa, Florida, didn't you? But it's I quite did. rainy right now. Uh, it's supposed to be rain all day. I'm going <laughs> to... We're expecting a change. We're expecting a change for tomorrow. Cool weather coming down here for November. That's...
That's our yeah. climate change for I'll us as we get a little bit cooler. I'm going to have some more of my cold filtered, cold brewed uh, chocolate raspberry coffee, and I don't know what you're drinking. Save some for me because mine's just plain old black coffee. But as always, guys, we appreciate your time that you spend with us. And if you have any other case studies you'd like to share with us or tip of the week, we'd be more than happy to entertain those and get those out to the rest of the group. Uh, as always, uh, we appreciate your time and we'd like you to stay safe and keep watching and, and like this video. Remember, if you like it, if you don't like it, you do nothing. Have a great day.